Happy November and Happy All Hallows Eve and All Saints Day. On November 1st, the church celebrates all the men and women of history who we believe as Christians have made it to their final destination of heaven. They've shared in the victory that Jesus won for us over sin and death, and now we believe they're praying for us. Not just the quote-unquote famous, well-known saints, but the countless quiet hidden saints who have lived and died as followers of Jesus Christ. If you receive the sacrament of confirmation in the Catholic Church, you probably remember that you took a saint's name on the day that you were confirmed. Well, it happens I took the name of Stephen. I don't remember being particularly attracted to the story of Saint Stephen, who the Bible tells us was the first martyr in the church, the first Christ Christian who died for Christ. He was stoned to death. I don't really remember being attracted to that story as a seventh grader, but I suspect that my mother, very nicely, ordered me to take that name because I was always fighting with my brother, who is named Stephen. Not sure. Anyway, today we begin a new preaching series called, You're Dead, So Now What? If you're new to our parish family, or you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. We've had the custom in the past few years of preaching in multi-week series that talk about a general theme over several weeks. Well, if you're checking us out, you might be thinking right now, he's going to talk about death for a whole month? That's the most depressing church I've ever been to. And you're thinking that, if you're thinking that, I'm glad you're here actually, because just maybe this is the one topic you need to hear about. I'm not making this up, because November is the month we Catholics traditionally think about and pray for our loved ones who have died. In fact, we have a whole day dedicated to it, November 2nd, which we call All Souls Day. And as St. John's is Monday, November 2nd at 5 p.m., as I announced, I will be offering a live stream Mass of Remembrance for All Souls. You know, there are a couple of good reasons for us dedicating this November series to the topic of death and what happens after death, because first of all, all of us have thought about it in the last eight months or so. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, if you were like me, you started hearing the terrible stories of people getting sick, both young and old, and you started thinking, it could happen to me, or it could happen to somebody I'm close to. This kind of thinking maybe led to a period of intense worry and anxiety that was only worsened by uncertainty and isolation. And perhaps some of you at some point during this pandemic actually thought about your own death for the very first time. You know, our prayers go out to anyone who has lost a loved one for any reason. My heart and my prayers especially go out to anyone who has suffered the tragedy of not being able to grieve as we normally would during this very difficult time. So just about eight months into this pandemic, some people feel safer and maybe are acting a little recklessly, while others, very understandably, continue to put safety first for themselves and for their families. And all of us, at least to some degree, still have at times that tangible feeling of fear, especially as COVID cases are going up again. Now we learn anything from this pandemic, maybe we'll learn this, that we cannot live in denial about the reality of death. I hate to break this to you, but despite all the advances in modern medicine, the death rate in our country still hovers around 100%. Everyone who lives dies. We can live a large chunk of our lives denying death, but nobody can avoid death. And don't miss this. We as Christians view the whole issue of death in a larger context, the context of eternity. Death is never the end of the conversation for people of faith. And maybe the reason there is such a great amount of denial about death is because most people, even a lot of people who call themselves Christians, don't really believe in life after death. Not really, if you're honest. This, I think, is especially true for many cultural Catholics. But here at St. John's, we've come to call the typical unchurched Catholic in our part of the Poconos, Bush Kilbab. 
Bob does not want to talk about death, but here's what Bob probably thinks. When I die, that's probably it. Who knows? And at that point, who cares? Because I'll be dead. I just hope that when it happens, it happens quickly. You know, even though we know that death is inevitable, even though, even though we know in our heads that it's going to happen, it doesn't seem natural. It doesn't seem normal. Death always startles us. We look at death and we say, it can't be the end. There has to be more. Perhaps that kind of intuition we have tells us something. Consider this. Our experience in life tells us that everything we long for can be found. Everything we yearn for can be gained. For example, we have a hunger for food. And on this earth we find food to satisfy our needs. We thirst and we find a world with water and other liquids that satisfy our thirst. We long for companionship and we find friends. We desire rest and there exists sleep and on and on. All the longings we have for life, we find completion on this earth. Reality reflects our needs. So it would seem that our longing for eternity, a longing for, for more than just this life, a longing for life after death, points to a reality. What happens after I die is a question that is written in the human heart because you and I know in our intuition that there has to be something more. And if you ask what that is, it's not a kind of philosophical question that's just debated by intellectual people. It's a very wise question for all of us to ask if we want to be wise. What happens after I die is the most practical question because the most certain part of life is death. And here's an important follow-up question. Does what I do now, here on this earth, have any impact on what happens to me after I die? If so, are there any choices and decisions I should be making before I die? Wise people, smart people, live their lives taking death into account. So what does, hap what does happen after I die? Just to let you know, to answer that question, we are going to rely on the teaching of the Bible as interpreted by the church. You might reject these sources, as authoritative sources, but that's where, that's where what we're saying is coming from. I'm not making this stuff up. This all comes from the Bible as taught to us by the church. But what happens after I die? If you grow up Catholic, you learn that after death, you're headed to one of three destinations, heaven, hell, or purgatory. And it, it, to introduce this topic on today's Feast of All Saints, in the gospel story we just heard, Jesus begins the most famous sermon he ever gave, and probably the most famous sermon ever, the so-called Sermon on the Mount. We heard the very beginning of the sermon, Jesus sat down at the top of a hill, then the crowd following him gathered around him, and he begins with the so-called Beatitudes. A Beatitude is simply a statement of blessedness, or a statement of blessing. And Jesus gives nine of these as a kind of preamble to the rest of the sermon. Notice that some of them, particularly the first four, are not what we would normally expect as human beings to happen to us in everyday life. But Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. But what Jesus is saying here is the opposite of our normal expectation. We don't expect in this life, if I am poor in spirit, whatever that means, that I will inherit a kingdom in heaven. I don't expect to be blessed while I am in mourning and grieving. Blessing might be the last thing on my mind. The idea that the meek inherit the land is again the opposite of what I expect. I expect in this world that the hardworking or the powerful or the cunning or the cutthroat or the lucky will get ahead. And who in this world other than those who fight for it are going to satisfy any of my hunger and thirst for righteousness? You see, these beatitudes that Jesus teaches us assume an out-of-this-world perspective. They assume a perspective of eternity that there is more than merely this life. 
Jesus always taught and lived with this perspective, an eye towards eternity. And he wants his followers to share that perspective too. Now, as for the three possible destinations in store for us after death, let's start with the easiest one first, hell. <laughs> well, Bush killed Bob is more or less of a mind that there is no life after death, but who knows? Bob definitely knows, he's absolutely certain that there is no such thing as hell. Hell is a made-up construct from a corrupt religious culture. It represents everything that's wrong with organized religion, and one big reason why he doesn't want anything to do with church. Just the idea that if you don't follow all these commandments, you know, you shall do this, or you shall not do that, that if you don't follow them, then you're gonna suffer an eternity of punishment and hellfire, which, by the way, is given by that same God, Christians claim is all loving. Well, that just seems like made up nonsense to scare kids. You might be surprised to know that I mostly agree with you. And I also believe in hell. And I believe that it's possible for people to end up there, although I don't know who and how many are actually there. I believe in hell, first of all, because it's in scripture, and that's enough for me. You might ask, how can an all-loving, all-merciful God create a hell for people? Good question. He didn't. The scriptures are clear that God didn't create hell for us. Hell is associated with evil that chooses to stand in opposition to God and his goodness. An evil connected with a being called Satan or simply the devil. Well, then why does God send people to hell? Good question. He doesn't. God doesn't send anyone to hell. And perhaps one of the greatest mysteries of life is that God creates us with free will. And ultimately, the choice is whether to live our lives for God or not. And God actually allows us this decision, no matter what, even if it means bad choices with bad consequences. So, who is in hell? Who's there? I don't know. And it really isn't for you or me or anybody else to guess. It's not about guessing whether Judas or Hitler is there, not to mention all the people you yourself have wished to send there. <laughs> but if we are going to be serious about our faith, we have to accept the reality that it exists. And when it comes to death, it's an option. Jesus talked about it all the time. He called it Gehenna, as he did in the Sermon on the Mount. This was a kind of teaching metaphor. Everybody in Jesus' audience knew what Gehenna referred to. Gehenna was an actual place. It was a valley just to the west of the city of Jerusalem. And it had long before Jesus' time become the city dump. It was dirty, it was smelly, and it was constantly on fire. So Jesus used this image of the city dump filled with smolder, smoldering garbage as a way to describe separation from God. Now next is purgatory. If you grew up Catholic, you know all about purgatory, but Bushkill Bob is a kind of convenient idea. You know, if any of this is real, at least there's a kind of in-between place just for me, you know, an insurance plan or a safety net. While that's not exactly it, I thank God actually for the idea of purgatory. If you grew up as a Protestant or evangelical Christian, you probably don't believe in purgatory because you were taught that it's not in the Bible. The Catholic Church teaches that the Bible clearly does teach it in several places. Purgatory is not for those who aren't good enough for heaven or bad enough for hell. It's a place for purgation and preparation. It's for people who have said yes to God's grace but need to be purified in some way of any attachment to sin. Just as gold or silver is refined and purified in fire, some people need to be purified and perfected before they enter into heaven. There's a scripture passage you've maybe heard at funerals that uses this kind of imagery. It says, the souls of the just are in the hand of God. Chastise a little, they shall be greatly blessed because God tried them. At gold in the furnace, he proved them. Purgatory is an act, actually an expression of the goodness of God who will go at, to any length to share his life for us. In purgatory, we are prepared for the experience of heaven. And it's amazing that God gives us that chance even after we die. And connected with this idea of purgatory 
is the Catholic practice of praying for the dead. We pray for the souls in purgatory. Can we pray them into heaven? Can our prayers earn them what they fail to earn themselves? No. Our prayer is not magic. It's support. We believe that in prayer for the living and the deceased, we can support one another, just as the saints in heaven, through their intercession, can support us. Well, the third possible definition, of course, when it comes to death, is heaven. Now, if you're Bush Bob, you probably don't really believe in heaven either. It's probably just the fairy tale. But if not, we all get to go to heaven because we've earned it by living good lives, basically being good people, which is defined and not murdering anybody. And if anybody suggests otherwise, you're insulted. Well, heaven is a topic we're going to spend some time talking about next week. And the one challenge for you this week is simple. Make a commitment to this series. Join us throughout this month. My friend Jesus says to his followers, those who become lifelong followers and students 